for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, Senator Agard is a longtime advocate in the legislature for uh, cannabis law reform. Uh, it's been an uphill fight for her and others in the legislature. He, uh, polls clearly show over and over that the majority of Wisconsin residents favor legalization, but the majority party in the legislature obviously does not. Uh, WJI strongly supports and has supported uh, Senator Agard's efforts to get uh, cannabis legalized and end the criminalization um, of cannabis for thousands of Wisconsin residents and people every year uh, getting convicted again and again for possession of, uh, of cannabis. Um, Senator Agard lives in Madison. She represents the 16th Senate District. She was elected to the Senate in November. Before that, she served in the Assembly, where she also sponsored cannabis reform efforts. Um, she's a small business owner and holds a degree in psychology from UW-Madison. We're honored to have her uh, here today to talk to us about her efforts to legalize cannabis in the legislature, its importance, and the challenges that we face in getting there. So Senator Agard, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Craig, and to the Wisconsin Justice Initiative for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. Um, I know that the most dangerous thing about cannabis in Wisconsin is that it is illegal. Um, the prohibition of cannabis in Wisconsin um, is frankly uh, one of the largest wrongs that we have in our state. Um, and I know that by legalizing uh, cannabis in Wisconsin that we will be a safer, more prosperous um, and more forward thinking community. Uh, I was uh, an unlikely uh, lead sponsor of this legislation, frankly, at the very beginning. Um, I did not campaign um, the first time I ran for office in the assembly on cannabis legalization. Um, but during my campaign and then after my election, people um, reached out to me. And it was interesting how many different people reached out to me and shared stories with me about how um, the prohibition of cannabis in Wisconsin harmed them and harmed people who they love. Um, not just from my district, but from across the state of Wisconsin. Um, I can only attribute that to the fact that I very much believe that the good work of a policymaker is primarily done outside of the Capitol building um, and spent an awful lot of time um, in my district and in communities across Wisconsin, um, supporting my colleagues in other um, parts of the state, as well as um, listening to people um, on what, you know, what issues mattered most to them and what it is that they felt like we could change. And whether it was um, parents talking about their kids losing scholarships to college or um, people who um, had been arrested for simple possession um, of cannabis, um, farmers who wanted to invest in their families um, and felt like there was a need um, to diversify, um, entrepreneurs um, and Wisconsin dreamers who had left the state and gone to other states and learned about the cannabis industry that wanted to come back, um, the real issues that we have in Wisconsin when it comes to brain drain and young people leaving the state of Wisconsin because our policies don't match what it is that's important to them. Um, the fact that our racial disparities are the worst in the nation. Um, and we know that people, um, black and brown people in the state are um, arrested at between four and seven times um, a higher rate than white people for simple possession. Um, folks that suffer from medical conditions that find great relief from using cannabis who don't wanna be criminals. Um, the list goes on and on and on about the stories that I had heard. Um, and to be quite frank, uh, there were also people that came to me who do have concerns about cannabis legalization. Um, but ultimately, I believe very strongly that by drafting legislation that provides protections regulations um, for the state of Wisconsin were able to uh, address many of the concerns that people brought to me um, about cannabis legalization, as well as addressing um, the wrongs that prohibition has caused in the state of Wisconsin. So I um, introduced the bill the first time as a freshman senator or freshman uh, representative, um, and it was a uh, it was a, a big bill to be working on as a freshman in um, a very divisive building. Um, it was introduced the very first time, the same session that Representative Nigren introduced his first um, bills addressing 
her the heroin epidemic um, in the state of Wisconsin. And initially, it, I was concerned that people would intertwine them um, because there is a lot of conversation about um, cannabis being a gateway drug. Um, and, you know, frankly, those people don't aren't up to date on um, science and information. Uh, so, you know, it's really important that we re-educate people, help educate people on um, the true science and, and, and the facts. Um, but it, despite my concerns, I knew it was the right thing to do. And um, when we did put the bill out for the first time, um, I learned what um, trending on Reddit meant. I had no idea what that meant before I put the bill out, but very quickly we started um, trending on Reddit nationally. Um, and people were curious why it is that a Democrat in Wisconsin who's deep in the minority would introduce a bill that certainly isn't going to go anywhere um, in the current climate. But I know very much that as a legislator, it is my job to hear the voices of the people of the state of Wisconsin and the people of my district. And this is something that they were, they were asking for. And I believed after doing my research and continue to believe is the right thing for our state. Over the eight years that have passed since I first introduced the legislation, um, we have grown in the number of co-sponsors on the bill. Um, the very first time we put the bill out in um, the legislature, we had um, six people that were on the bill in support of it, as well as myself, myself and five other people. And the last time we put the bill out, last session, um, there were 22. And this session, the governor included um, the bill in his state budget. So certainly, um, we know that the vast majority of the people in Wisconsin, and frankly, across our nation, um, support cannabis, um, removing the prohibition of cannabis. Um, recent polls from Pew show that less than 10% of the people in our nation um, are prohibitionists at this point in time. So it is a conversation that people are very hungry for. Um, and as the states around us um, are legalizing, we know that there are a lot of tax dollars that are leaving the state of Wisconsin. If you go down to South Beloit, which is less than an hour from my home in Madison, um, the parking lot is full of Wisconsin license plates. Very few of the folks that are in the parking lot are actually from Illinois. Um, and you know that means that people are taking time to drive there, they're paying for the gas, and they're willing to pay Illinois sales tax in order to have access to cannabis. At the same time, we know that this is a booming business in the state of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, right now it's um, considered a black market business, but um, it is a million dollar, if not billion dollar industry um, that currently exists in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but we don't exactly know what those numbers are because of the fact that it is, um, it is a prohibited substance. So I know that through this legislation, we would be investing in addressing our egregious racial disparities. Um, there are a lot of social justice aspects to full legalization. Um, additionally, uh, we would be able to support our farmers, our agricultural heritage, um, folks who want access to a plant that provides them with medicinal relief. Um, as well as addressing people's personal liberties and freedom and entrepreneurial spirit, which are really things that are important to folks in Wisconsin. I know that this is not a partisan issue anywhere, except in the Capitol building here in Wisconsin. There have been Republican and Democratic governors, Republican and Democratic um, lawmakers across the state, across our nation that have been champions of this, um, this policy. And I very much look forward to when it is um, that I have bipartisan support on the le this legislation. I continue to talk to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Behind closed doors, there's a number of them that support um, the bill, but their message they're getting from their leadership is this is not a priority of ours. So ultimately, um, I know we need to continue talking about it, educating people, and um, I applaud the governor for um, seeing uh, and responding to the calls of people across the state and joining um, joining me and um, so many people who have educated me and been um, really my role models um, and my beacons as, as I brought this bill forward. Um, the bill has um, changed a little bit since it was first introduced based on what it is that we've learned from other states as well as um, what it is that we've learned from um, people that we have talked to. 
Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it is taxing and regulating cannabis in the same way we tax and regulate alcohol in Wisconsin um, for adult responsible usage. Um, it does have a provision um, that would allow uh, doctors to be able to prescribe um, uh, cannabis, so it does have a medicinal component in the bill, and it also has a, a grow your own component as well for people to be able to um, grow and cultivate up to six plants. Um, we also have um, provisions in the bill that would uh, make sure that we are investing in Wisconsin businesses. Um, so Wisconsin farmers, um, Wisconsin manufacturers, producers, um, and um, storefronts would be for five years the only people that would be able to be involved in the industry and there are social justice aspects to the legislation for expungement um, as well as for petitioning of release if people are currently sitting in the system um, and uh, social and access to funds for um, for folks that are typically uh, kind of frozen out of the cannabis industry and in other states, um, we have seen that it is harder for women and people of color to enter the industry. Um, so we do provide um, grant processes for folks to be able to um, enter into the industry if they fall into those categories. Um, this session, um, after the governor announced uh, the budget provision, this being included in, in the budget, um, we did put an online poll um, for people to sign on to that we would share with the Joint Finance Committee members because ultimately they have the final say on what stays and goes in the budget. And within less than a month, we had over 2,500 people that are um, Wisconsinites um, who signed on to that petition um, supporting keeping this provision in the budget. But the Joint Finance Committee did um, remove the bud remove this provision from the budget. It cannot be put back in the way it is that they removed it. Um, so we do have a commitment from our office um, to reintroduce the bill as a standalone policy um, and are hopeful, um, though we don't we do know it's a big climb uh, to have a public hearing. Um, and if we don't get a, you know, an official public hearing, we will be um, asking for feedback and comments from people in the public on, on the legislation. Um, additionally, I know many of you are in Milwaukee. There's been a lot of work um, within our local governments um, to address uh, decriminalization of cannabis at the local level. That's really um, the only other you know, at the local level, uh, because of the way our state laws are written, they, it cannot be legalized, but it can be decriminalized. And I really applaud that work. That's something that has happened in Dane County and Madison, where I live, and I know Milwaukee is working on that as well. Um, but it is still a problem um, that we have, we have prohibition, that it is illegal. And I think we need to do everything that we can. Um, these local governments working very hard, um, local officials working very hard to address the wrongs, um, but we still need to, um, in order to have the full effects um, in all um, aspects, moving Wisconsin forward, um, full legalization is certainly um, the best choice as far as I'm concerned. And then on the other end, at the federal level, um, I think it's very important that um, cannabis is reclassified. Um, right now it is on a list of um, uh, substances. Many of them are very, very concerning. Um, they actually kill people and they harm society. Um, and cannabis does not kill people and harm society um, because of it itself being illegal actually causes more harm to society. So the reclassification um, Ne absolutely needs to happen at the federal level. We need to be addressing um, banking um, and uh, how it is that the cannabis industry can have access to safe and secure banking. Um, and that needs to happen at the federal level. And I am hopeful, I'm, I, you know, we have heard that Congress is committed to moving a bill forward. Um, and it's a little bit harder in the Senate, but uh, they are going to be debating it as well. And ultimately, I know it's not a matter of if this happens, it's a matter of when it happens and how it happens. Is this going to happen at the federal level, very similar to um, gay marriage? Um, or is it going to continue to march forward in the same way that it is now, where states are one by one deciding if they do medicinal or full legalization or um, some sort of hybrid um, and you know, certainly I love the idea of a Wisconsin bill because we can honor Wisconsin businesses and Wisconsin's culture. Um, but at this point, 
because of the divisiveness in this building, it's quite possible that this will actually be addressed at the federal level. Um, but certainly our conversations at the state level um, are very important to helping um, this process move forward in any, in any way possible. Um, again, the most dangerous thing about cannabis in our state and in our country is that it remains illegal. Um, and I know that we can um, address many wrongs um, by legalizing. Um, and Wisconsin is very quickly becoming an island of prohibition. Prohibition did not work when it came to alcohol, um, and it did not work when it came to, to margarine. Um, you know, people were going across borders. Um, and it's not okay that one, a person can have one foot in one state and one foot in another state um, and be treated very, very differently um, because of the possession of this plant. Uh, I would love to be able to open up to conversation with you all and answer your questions. Um, this is a powerful group of people. Um, and I'm quite sure that after this, I will have learned from you all. And I am hopeful that you know, we can continue the work on this policy um, because it is the right thing for Wisconsin. All right, if you have any questions, just type your name in the chat box or just say, I have a question or raise your hand. Uh, but I know that Gretchen has a couple questions to start off with. Gretchen, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I know that one of the big concerns in California, at least, was what was going into illegal cannabis, the poisonous additives, the pesticides. Do you know if there's been any testing done on homegrown in Wisconsin and whether they're finding dangerous stuff in the unregulated market? Uh, so that's a really good uh, point and question. Uh, we know that, you know, it's not just um, pesticides and herbicides. Um, mold can end up growing um, within cannabis. Uh, depending on how it is stored, there could be um, other foreign substances that are in it. And um, there have been people out there that have said, oh, what if it is that you get cannabis that's been laced with something? Now, it's very unlikely um, that folks are getting cannabis that's been laced, um, but you know that is, that is a concern. Additionally, cannabis, there are so many different strains of cannabis as well as um, different potencies of cannabis that it is, I think, very important that people know what it is that they are getting and that they are educated on what it is that they are getting. Um, so having um, the folks that work in the dispensaries educated um, about cannabis and having to go through a process in order to get a license to sell it in the same way that a bartender would have to get a license to serve alcohol um, is very important to me, as well as the way it is that we, um, that, that we sell it, uh, you know, that people know the percentages of um, THC that they know that there are there are not pesticides, herbicides, um, that there is not mold um, and potentially other controlled substances that are added to it. Um, and there's there's I in at one point in time um, I had heard in Colorado um, with the edibles that people would buy or make brownies or buy gummies, and then they would spray um, the, the THC on the product. So when you got the pro like one bunch of it had a certain amount of THC, but you didn't know through different bites um, and how it is that you were consuming if there was equal amounts. So, you know, also addressing how it is that we manufacture the cannabis so that products so that you know when you, if it's an edible, something that you're consuming that there's um, that there's equal spread and you're not getting a, a big bite um, of high potency and then you have another bite that doesn't have any potency there's a there's you know in the same same regulations that we would have with with most um, things that we consume are, are very very important and we take those um, take those into consideration in the legislation can I ask one more Margo Okay, um, I've read a million things about 
who's behind the opposition in the state and why. <laughs> What's your opinion? Is it is the opposition sincerely held beliefs or is it, you know, the Tavern League conspiracy or is it just money? Is it just politics? Is it just you're for it so we have to get it be against it? What's behind it? Well, I think it really depends on who it is that you're you're talking to. Um, I do think that there are, you know, some folks that continue to suffer from reefer madness, from misinformation, from old science, um, maybe not even science, uh, old, old stories, and they need to be um, brought up to speed on this, but it's, you know, unless they invest their time and energy to actually look at the science and the data, um, that's, that's a pretty hard hill to climb, but we do know um, from countries and states that have legalized um, and countries that actually can study uh, that it is the most dangerous thing is that it remains illegal um, and that we can address those concerns by by moving the policy forward. There are, I think, I'm, I don't buy into the Tavern League being, you know, the boogeyman in this conversation. Um, I do think that it's more, this is a policy that has brought, brought forward by Democrats, um, that the governor has included it in his budget and folks don't want a win, you know, that it is actually a political, um, suffering from political, um, the, the stresses of between the parties. Um, there's, people don't care about that though in Wisconsin, right? Like at, at the end of the day, folks all across Wisconsin, it's not about who signed a bill or whose name was on um, the front of a memo. They just want this to be done. And I am happy to work with my Republican colleagues. I earnestly walk around and talk to them, you know, sit down in their offices and have conversations and welcome them to put their name in front of mine on this legislation if that's what it would take in order for it to be able to move forward. Um, you know, I think that part of it is that there's not a lot of money in Wisconsin lobbying for this, um, for this bill. Um, and when you look at what it is that does move forward, there's a, typically a lot of money behind um, the different policies that do move forward, the bigger policies that do move forward. Um, we know that this would bring in hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue um, and, and fees um, you know, that people would pay in order to enter the industry, as well as create good family sustaining jobs and billions of dollars of economic stimulus, more so than you know, the Foxconn deal, uh, which was actually a cost to taxpayers. This is something that would be a job creator and would also um, be a positive when it comes to the tax column. So. Um, I think it is, it's mostly about political will and the priorities of just a couple of people in the building that really have their thumbs down on um, their colleagues within their caucuses. Thanks. Ariel, go ahead, unmute and ask your question. And anyone else, please <coughs> type in the chat box if you have one to ask as well. Hi. You had said something earlier and I happened to get distracted right at the precise wrong moment, as is my luck, um, about uh, something about the, the people that would be allowed to get into the industry. And you said something about existing storefronts. I, I heard the word storefronts and I own a storefront building and I would give anything to be able to turn it into a can of business. So I'm trying to figure out exactly what sort of things I know you said something about helping people women to get into grants and that sort of, so what could you be a little more precise about what your bill covers in that regard new people that wanting to wanting to get into the industry and existing businesses yeah so we uh my staff Sydney um put a bunch of resources in the chat section so there's a link to um the bill that was introduced last session. Now the bill will be changed slightly from what it is that there is there. There's a copy of an editorial um, that I recently wrote as well as, an, uh, or that I was mentioned in um, supporting the bill, an op-ed that we wrote as well as the report from the Milwaukee DA's office on um, the social justice aspects of this bill. Um, Excellent. I see those links now. Thank you very much. And in response to something else that you said earlier, I'm, I turned 62 
on next Monday. And I am planning a birthday trip down to Illinois so that I can scratch smoke legal weed off my bucket list. So the, my, the state that I chose that I, I was raised in, in, in Illinois, I chose Wisconsin. I chose to move to the forward state of Wisconsin from Illinois. If I had stayed in the state that I was raised in, my medicine would be legal. But instead, I have to go to another state to spend money in another state and give tax dollars to another state and give a hotel fee to another state so that I can do what I should be able to do here in my own storefront building that I would give anything to turn into a can of business and not be on disability anymore. That would be awesome. <laughs> so just that's it. I'm done now. Thank you. We'll work. We'll keep working for you. That's Thank you. Get you into business. Lou, go ahead and ask your question. Unmute. Hi, Melissa. Hey, Lou. How are you? Well, uh, so I have a question, um, and I don't think I think this would be uh, doable uh, from just thinking back uh, to to my time there. Um, if the uh, Republican majority will not, uh, uh, the appropriate committee chair uh, would not hold a hearing. What if you uh, just uh, reserved a, uh, a hearing room and basically put together your own hearing? Uh, we would help you promote it. Um, and uh, and just you know another way to to build some support and and show interest and and there may be a few of your uh, Republican colleagues that might want to sit on the uh, your um, you know your own created committee or or maybe even get one of them to be a co co uh, chair with you they probably would be afraid to do that but um, but just do something where you you put together you put together a hearing um, yeah and 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 collect information and bring, invite the press and, and do all of that. Have you considered that? Uh, we, we have, and it's refreshing that people are getting vaccinated at the rates that they are. Um, I'm proud of my community and I'm proud of our state in leading those efforts. Um, hopefully by fall, it will be safe to do something like that in the building. Um, we just recently reopened um, to the public uh, and I do think that providing people with the opportunity to come in is important. I do also know that um, over the years, Wisconsin um, has had a number of non-binding referendums because we don't have binding referendums in Wisconsin um, on whether or not cannabis should be legalized. If we should lift the prohibition of cannabis, the questions have been answered, question worded differently in different communities. Um, and one of the thing that is, uh, that I have heard from folks is, you know, it is frustrating to them that we continue to put questions on ballots when we can't actually take initiative. Um, and I think that putting it forward in a way that people realize it is not an actual public hearing endorsed by the majority party is important. Otherwise people, um, they will continue to be frustrated even with us on our side. Um, and, and I, um, I'm very aware of that feedback that I've received from folks, but I, I do think that's something that could happen. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, anyone else, please put your name in the chat box if you so uh, desire to ask a question. But in the meantime, uh, Senator, I am a municipal judge and I've seen uh, a fair number of juvenile uh, tickets for possession. And so with your legislation, like what protections would there be for, you know, keeping it out of the hands of 14 year olds, 15 year olds, you know, if it's legalized, is it easier for them to, to be getting it than it is now probably, but what are the protections against, you know, getting it down into those middle school age kids? Well, frankly, our kids can get cannabis pretty easily right now and it's illegal. Um, I've got four kids, um, and I have talked to them about this at, you know, it's an interesting dinner table conversation, um, for me to be having with my kids. And I think all of us should be talking to our kids about it, but it's easier for them. Uh, they believe to get cannabis than it would be for them to get alcohol these days. Um, simply the way the market exists. 
in the bill that I have drafted and that I have worked on, we do have provisions about educating kids in schools. There'd be, you know, mandated um, education um, within our schools uh, to talk to kids about um, controlled substance usage or, you know, just in general, how it is that you take care of yourself. Um, an honest, real conversation with our kids. It's important that, you know, they don't have too much screen time on their cell phones. It's important that they get adequate sleep, that they eat healthy, um, that they exercise, that they know that their brains and bodies are continuing to develop until they're 26 years old. But the prohibition of cannabis, we're not, we're talking about pot in the same way that we're talking about heroin, meth, um, cocaine, and other really terrible substances that will kill and hurt people that do kill and hurt people every day in our state that they know and these kids are smart. They know that people are not dying because of cannabis and it is a bit of a because of the way it is set up right now. It, it's a bit of a double standard and it creates a, a conversation amongst our young people where you know they don't believe what it is that they're being taught in the dare programs in our schools currently because they see a difference in how people who they know use cannabis um, how their bodies react to it than people who they know that are using heroin and meth. But if we can actually talk about smart usage and the fact that it is not, it is not right for our kids, um, uh, they're smart. It, you know, in my opinion, it's very much in the same way, same vein that we should have comprehensive fact-based sex ed within schools. Kids are going to have sex, whether or not you're teaching sex ed or not. Um, my Republican colleagues believe that if we don't talk about sex ed, that kids aren't going to have sex. Um, and, and this is the same, to me, it's very much the same. Kids are hungry for the knowledge and they're smart. And when we um, provide that education, it is important. The bill that I have drafted um, is there's a 21 year limit in the same way that we have a 21 limit on ac access and consumption of alcohol. Um, unless there is a doctor um, who is saying that a child should have access to cannabis for medicinal um, reasons. Uh, there are um, provisions about how close um, dispensaries, compassion centers can be to schools. Um, you know, we don't want them to be right next door. Um, and certainly um, there continue to be penalties for people that would be selling on the black market um, directly to kids because we know that that's not okay as well. If you have ideas on you know, other things that we can do to strengthen, I would love to talk to you. We've also taken into consideration packaging. Um, you know, one of the things my kids love, um, uh, you know, the Sour Patch Kids and, and gummy worms, you know, you stop at the, the truck stop and you know, that's something that they wanna get on our, on our trips. And um, you know, I think that in states where you do have um, uh, cannabis products that look like things that kids are used to eating, um, that can be a problem. Um, and there have been other states that have led um, the way it is that cannabis edibles are packaged, um, you know, not in bright, colorful packages that are appealing to kids or that kids might be confused by, um, child proof packaging, um, as well as, um, you know, very clear disclaimers on the packaging. Craig has a question. Go ahead and unmute. Um, thanks. I, I guess a couple of questions. Number one is, do you think that the um, medical marijuana, I know you touched on it briefly, has any more of a chance or is there any more momentum for that? Um, and then the second question is about the idea of uh, getting rid of the option for charging um, second or subsequent possession cases as felonies. Um, that's one of the you know, biggest sort of social justice, racial disparities aspect of, of uh, marijuana uh, cannabis prohibition is that people can be actually convicted of a felony for possessing very small amounts. It doesn't necessarily happen, I don't think in Milwaukee all that often or Madison certainly, but out around the state, it, it certainly does. So I wonder if you could comment on those two issues. Um, absolutely. So one of, I would recommend if you haven't read um, the Milwaukee DA's um, report, um, we did put it in the, um, in the chat and, you know, it happens more 
frequently than we would like it to. Certainly these are, you know, there's huge social justice aspects to this legislation. Um, when it comes to medicinal um, or full legalization or decriminalization, really the devil is in the details. As with any policy, um, with any bill, you really need to dig in and see what it is that people are proposing. Um, I know that the Republicans have introduced medicinal bills um, in previous sessions um, recently, and they are um, similar to the uh, legislation that is currently in existence in Minnesota, um, the most restrictive medicinal policy in the nation, I believe, is in Minnesota. So it doesn't allow people to have access to the plant. It doesn't allow um, smoking. Uh, it only in, is uh, pill form or um, uh, oils um, or, or tinctures. And there are two, dis, two um, uh, facilities in Minnesota that actually produce and manufacture all the products. So it doesn't really support the main street businesses, um, the farmers, um, or allow people to have access to a plant. And we know a lot of people actually prefer that way of consuming cannabis. So I would say, you know, I, you know, I fully believe that um, full legalization for adult responsible usage is the way to go, that it does more to address um, the wrongs of our communities. Um, but, you know, if we were to work, if another person was to work on a medicinal bill, I think it is really important that people pay attention to the details. If my Republican colleagues introduced the bill that they did last time, uh, I know that Wisconsin would be very disappointed if that ended up passing. Um, because it would be a box checked and many people in the legislature would say, okay, we did that, we don't need to do any more. Um, and in fact, it would not address the racial disparities. It would not address um, the, the felony charges. Um, it would not support our farmers um, or our small businesses. Gretchen, did you have another question? I do. Um, your bill in the past, I don't re remember the exact number, had a revenue estimate that I thought was fairly low. I'm wondering if you have an updated estimate or you have, I know it was a conservative estimate, what you think in state revenue full legalization actually could bring to Wisconsin. Yeah, so the current um, fiscal that we have that was included in the governor's budget is $165 million. Um, within the first biennium. Uh, based on what we've seen in other states, we believe that's pretty low. Um, we also know, you know that not only is it the tax revenue and the, the fees that would be collected for people that want to buy into the industry um, to get their licenses, uh, but we would have savings within the criminal um, justice realms, you know, from our jails and prisons um, for our local police departments. Um, we would have um, likely billions of dollars of economic stimulus that would enter the state of Wisconsin. And I agree, Gretchen, that that um, financial um, that we have from the Fiscal Bureau is low, um, but they tend to tend to look on the conservative side when it comes to when it comes to these numbers. Um, Ultimately, uh, and I, I've said it and I'm going to continue to say it, this is a very successful industry in the state of Wisconsin currently, but it's all, it's all, all in the black market, right? It's all in the shadows. Um, there are people that are um, sustaining themselves and their families, and, uh, but they're also living on the edge and uh, that, that's not okay. Allison, go ahead, unmute and ask your question. Hi, so kind of along the lines of comparing to other states, I'm wondering what uh, you and your colleagues have learned from Illinois' policies, particularly the social justice aspects. Um, many people that I've spoken with, and I'm a researcher at the University of Illinois, um, I'm, I'm a PhD student, so I'm studying this a little bit, but I'm particularly interested in the social justice and criminal legal aspects. Um, but many people are saying that Illinois missed the mark, especially regarding opportunities to enter the cannabis industry and that there's still those racial disparities. 
Uh, yeah, it's very important that we realize that the people that have been most harmed by the prohibition of cannabis um, are people, tend to be people of color and um, women. And providing, and we also know in states that have legalized that the vast majority of the people that have been able to get into the industry are um, not people of color and women. Um, they historically have, they just have access to more capital and the connections in order to be able to, to make things happen. Uh, so we do have, have taken that into consideration and um, worked, one of the changes that will be, that isn't in the bill um, as seen in the chat, but was included in the governor's provision, we were able to work with the governor to make um, sure that we are um, taking, uh, you know, doing better. Um, Illinois worked hard, um, harder than most states when they um, legalized to, to try to address the racial disparities um, in entering the industry. Um, but I I believe that they think they could have done better. And, you know, one of the things about legislating is knowing that you can introduce um, new pieces of legislation to address, address those those concerns. And I, I believe that there are people in Illinois that are that are working on doing that. And we have, you know, learned from them as well as from other states uh, and hopefully are doing a better job of threading that needle. Um, I do know that there are some states, for example, um, in their legislation that prohibit people who have arrests um, or have been charged with cannabis related offenses from entering the industry. Um, I don't believe that. So in our bill, we do not have that prohibition. We actually allow people, you know, explicitly allow people who have been harmed by the industry or have arrested, have an arrest um, to be able to enter the industry. Um, because we know that that can, that likely uh, um, impacts uh, people of color more likely than white folks. Senator, can you talk a little bit more about the expungement? Would this be uh, expunging, you know, all past possessions, or, or you know, just within a certain time frame, or you know, the felony convictions? Are, are there restrictions on what would be expunged? Uh, there's so uh, again, the details of the bill are in the chat. Um, but ultimately what we do is provide a path for people to petition for expungement. So it's not, you automatically are expunged when the bill is passed, but that you would have a way to petition to have your record expunged. Or if you are currently sitting within the system that there would be a way for you to petition um, for release if you believe um, that you should be, you know, if it's, if, if what it is that you did um, would have been legal if this bill had been passed, those are the people that most likely would have um, their records expunged or would be released. It's a little bit tricky, as many of you know, that oftentimes cannabis um, crimes are attached to other, um, to other, um, other crimes or you know, other, other things that people have done. So, it's, it's uncommon, I'm not gonna say it doesn't happen, but it's uncommon that someone is going to, for example, be put in jail or in prison um, because of possession. It's more likely they will receive a ticket for that. Um, it, but you know, maybe you were speeding, maybe you had um, uh, you know, broken headlights or didn't have tags on your car or, um, you know, it, there was a, a disturbance and the police were called to it and then they find the cannabis, they use it. You know, it's, it's one of many things that is on a list that people um, enter the criminal justice system for. Gretchen has one more. And if anyone else has a final question after Gretchen, just please put your name in the chat. Thanks. Uh, since CBD is now legal in Wisconsin and has a lot of the same smell, look, feel characteristics, and since the police in Milwaukee at least have the best noses in the state of Wisconsin for smelling marijuana at 600 yards, is there any chance of getting a prohibition on using the smell of cannabis as a probable cause for a search, especially of a vehicle? 
So I believe that there are um, cases working their way through the courts to um, to test that, to address that. Um, I, I mean, because of the, especially because of the farm bill, um, hemp and CBD is completely legal. I have a kid that was working on a hemp farm and then he signed a lease to have, you know, have his own apartment. And then he received a email from the landlord uh, that said, we're getting um, complaints from your neighbors that you're smoking cannabis in your apartment or apartment and you're in violation of your lease. And he had to respond to them saying, I work at a hemp farm. This is what my job is. And they actually wanted, you know, proof that that was, that was his job. And you know, that's, that's where he lives. And, you know, he's got privilege. He's my kid. He's white. Um, he lives in Madison. So uh, this is a real, you know, not only is it affecting, um, as you pointed out, uh, traffic stops, um, but it, it's affecting where people live. Um, and, you know, frankly, uh, that's, that's not okay. Senator, thank you so much. Uh, unless uh, anyone wants to unmute and ask a question. I see Paul. I don't know, Paul, if we got to your, I don't think you spoke yet. Paul, thank did you, you want to ask anything? I do. I do. I, I appreciate this opportunity. And uh, the, it's, it's a question and a bit of a statement. I'll try to keep it succinct. Um, there's a premise behind this whole discussion that the, the government, the state, actually has a legitimate right to control what human beings decide to inoffensively put into their bodies. There's a, the, the whole, the, the character of the conversation is we are pleading to, the, to our, our, our masters at the state for the privilege of consuming a substance that we have a natural right. We have an inherent immutable, inalienable right to be the masters of our own bodies. But we're, we're put in a position where we're pleading for an, a right to be, to be uh, uh, given to us as a privilege. We're asking for the privilege of consuming cannabis. And the government is saying, well, if you pay these taxes and follow these licenses and do, jump through all these hoops, well, we'll let you have a little cannabis. And I know it's a, it's a tough question, but I'm, can anybody explain to me I can't, I can't tell Margo or Gretchen that you can't consume a substance. I don't have the right to do that. Yet, somehow, that right has been delegated to the government. Nobody has, nobody has that right in the first place. So, uh, you know, we have a government that purports to be founded on the principle that it, its powers are, those are limited to those delegated to it by its citizens but none of us has the right to delegate that power to the government, yet the government is exercising it with coercion and violence across all these drugs. And, and I'm just wondering if anybody can explain to me, how is it that it's legitimate that the government has a right to control what we put in our bodies? Please, somebody, somebody explain it to me. Why, is that, why does the government have a legitimate right to control what we put in our bodies? Thank you. Anybody? Well, I, I would like, I would just like to point out, I can't, I mean, that's a big, huge question. And I think uh, crosses into many, many policies. But if my bill was to be passed, you yourself would be able to grow plants um, and do what you want with those plants for your own personal, um, your own personal pleasure, whether it was consume them, I mean, you could not sell them. Um, but you could put that in your body in whatever way it is that you wanted, you know, making butter or smoking, um, making brownies, um, whatnot. And you would not have to pay uh, anything to the government for that right. Uh, but, you know, we could be talking about abortion right now. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we could be talking about, um, we do have age limits and restrictions on alcohol consumption. Um, and the bill that I have drafted mirrors um, that, and that is something that is accepted um, clearly in the state of Wisconsin as a, as a fine line um, for people to follow. And, uh, um, you know, t people tend not to have a problem with that. Um, so that's why it is that we chose 21 um, 
for the age limit with our legislation. I could have been convinced that 26 was right based on brain development um, and new science. And I could be convinced that 18 is the right age limit because that's where cigarettes are and when you can go into the military. But we landed on 21 um, because taxing and regulating alcohol um, was the model that we built the taxing and regulating cannabis off of. But let me just, can I just follow up quickly? And, but you're still, the, the premise of your response is, is that that you have the you have the authority and the right to to bestow this a privilege. You're saying, yeah, you can you can grow some cannabis and consume it if you want. We'll give you that privilege. That's a right that I have. It's well, a right. Currently, you know, I'm trying to fix the system. So, uh, you know, this is where it is uh, that I believe we can fix the system. There is no state in the nation that I believe that has decided that they're going to treat cannabis in the same way that they treat tomatoes or grass. Um, and you know, you, I, this is, this is, you know, quite frankly, it's a challenging conversation um, for many people. And there are some people that are going to feel that we didn't go far enough. And there's going to be some people that think we went too far. Um, but how it is that we bring all of those concerns and thoughts together and um, weave them with one another and thread them through the needle is a bill that I have drafted and that I've been talking about for eight years. And um, you know, I'm going to continue continue down this path because I do agree that we need to figure out a way to honor people's personal liberties and freedom better than what we are doing now. Thank you. Any final question? If you have a question, go ahead and unmute and ask it. All right. Well, thank you, Senator, for joining us today. And uh, our next salon will be in June, probably mid-June on a Wednesday. Oh, we have we do have one more question, uh, but I'll just finish up that we will have the speaker announced and the date announced shortly, but we don't have it just yet. Uh, Jeffrey, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't have a question. I was just clapping. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, again, thank you so much, Senator, and we look forward to seeing everyone again in June.